First up is Guy Ritchie's The Covenant, and yes, that is the full title of the film, and I always find there to be an excessive amount of arrogance when any of these directors put their names above the title of the movie. Like, could we not just have called it The Covenant, but, you know, Guy Ritchie's Operation Fortune and uh, just the hubris involved. And yes, I know there are marketing reasons for it, but do we have to? Anyway, I am not a huge Guy Ritchie fan. I've been relatively vocal about that. Some of his early work I respect, but of late, I just find myself dreading when I see his name above the title of a movie. And so when I saw that he was making a war movie, I was a little bit perplexed because I don't think he's actually made a a sort of realistic war movie before. You know, his work is very action heavy and, and violent and hyperbolic. And I was worried about an excessive amount of sort of jingoism in this film. And I will give credit where credit is due. You know, I thought he actually did a decent job of keeping it gritty. You know, there are moments where the characters talk in a way that feels reminiscent of his other films. And it sounds a little bit weird when it's coming from people with non-British accents. So you've got Jake Gyllenhaal as uh, Sergeant John Kinley in this, who is a U.S. Army sergeant. He's very proficient. He's stationed in Afghanistan. And there is a a translator who gets assigned to his unit effectively, played by Dar Salim, who I thought did a very good job. Uh, You know, you've got a couple other folks in the film. You've got Anthony Starr, Emily Beecham, Johnny Lee Miller, Alexander Ludwig. But this is really the Jake Gyllenhaal, Dar Salim show. And I think if it had been an actor less than Jake Gyllenhaal and less than Dar Salim, though I have not seen him in anything uh, or that I know of, you know, I, I think it wouldn't have worked, but they were both very committed to their roles and I give them credit for that. The film feels a little bit bloated. So the premise is basically that, you know, they uh, get ambushed and uh, the interpreter goes to just absolutely absurd lengths in order to save this U.S. Army sergeant who... You know, it's he's putting this guy above his own safety and his family's safety and things like that. And then sort of the uh, fallout from those things. And there were moments where it just really, there are a lot of sequences where I'm like, we are just in like a fever dream and it's going on and on. And I don't know, we, we could have told this story more efficiently and I think it would have worked better. I think it works okay as is. It's very action heavy. You know, the relationship between them in the beginning, of the, the first third of the movie, I found the writing to be, like I said, a little bit much and strange coming from these characters. But by the time we focus on the two of them, that's where it starts to shine. Again, the circumstances of this movie are absurd. I'm 99% sure it is fictional, but I, I allow that 1% to just in case I'm very wrong. But I think they would have touted the hell out of it if it had been based on a true story. But the circumstances are very ridiculous. But, you know, <sighs> Because I think I went in with such low expectations, I was pleasantly surprised by it. It is still violent. It is still, uh, you know, effectively any of these types of movies are semi-pro-military. I think it does help that, you know, Guy Ritchie is not an American. And so he is maybe able to take a little level of uh, scrutiny to those characters and stuff like that but you know these are these are effectively superhero characters in a realistic based world and I'm like um okay you know I can deal with it because that's the same criticism I have for most military based films it it always makes me feel really old when I see films that are based in the Afghanistan war or the Iraq war because I you know those were fresh for me as opposed to like a world war ii or something anyway that's a me problem but yeah you know I'm not running out to tell people to go see this. I feel like my dad is someone who would maybe appreciate this movie. I, I, you know, I always look at it through the metrics of both my parents and my family and friends. And I'm like, yeah, my dad would probably be more of a fan of this movie than my mom would. Less to do with gender roles there and more to just do with, I don't know, tolerance for (laughs) bad storytelling. It's not bad storytelling, but I feel like this is just like a dad movie. There, You know, there's a certain subgenre of movies that feel like dad movies. I think if you are into this type of action military story, yes, the itch will be scratched for you. You know, again, I'm not running out to tell folks like, oh my God, this is the greatest war story I've ever seen. Uh, You know, this is life changing. This is like a Saving Private Ryan type scenario, which I think does transcend a little bit better, but it's not bad, you know? So if you feel like it, you could definitely go see it. I'm going to give it a 3.1 out of 5. The next film I have is called Ghosted, and it's on Apple TV+. And oh boy, (laughs) this movie. Uh, So it stars Chris Evans and Ana de Armas, which, okay, good job. You know, those are some pretty hot folks in Hollywood right now. And they're both, you know, attractive, I think most people would agree. And I've never seen a movie where they are trying so hard to convince 
themselves and also the audience that these characters have romantic chemistry like i'm sorry this is a tiny spoiler but there's this running joke about like you should get a room and i'm like these two are like wet paper bags next to each other <laughs> like just because two people are attractive and you put them next to each other does not mean that they have romantic chemistry or even on-screen chemistry you know i there oh my god it's and that is the whole crux of the film is that the you know they chris evans character is just a sort of regular joe and he falls for anna de Armas, and then turns out spoilers but it's also the trans etc she's a super spy and again these are like superhero s characters where her skills are unparalleled you know i, I think that's my big beef about a lot of these films is like nobody no, the heroes never miss um, and the bad guys always have terrible aim. But anyway, um, so like I said, the, the chemistry, which they are trying to sell us on so, so hard, is not there. And you need that so badly in a film like this. And I just kept going, what is like, what happened here? I don't know. Did they never do a re? I, it feels like they met the first day on set and it, like never talked to each other during. And I don't think they're bad actors separately. I just don't think that this was the right casting of this. You know, this is terrible, but I could like accents aside. I'm like, maybe they could have played siblings. <laughs> like that might've been a better, you know, uh, uh, scenario than trying to force this us, us to you know trying to like delude us and themselves into thinking that these two characters belong together in some way I'm just oh and I just want to be clear I don't think either of them is necessarily like individually bad in this I just feel almost bad for them that they are probably trying their best oh my god I I it was almost so bad that I enjoyed it but that's the problem is that it did not go so far into that territory that I could be like this was so terrible you have to watch it it was just sort of like oh this is this is not, I don't I don't think this is very good. You know, the action is fine. It's pretty violent. Uh, you've also got Adrian Brody, Amy Sedaris and Tate Donovan, Tim Blake Nelson, you know, Mike Moe. There's a ton of cameos in it. I don't want to spoil them, but cause that was one of the few moments where I was like, oh, OK, that's fun, I guess. Like, I'm glad there were at least a couple fun days on set. <laughs> And I think that I had I didn't dig into this before, record, but, I, you know, Dexter Fletcher is the director of this. And I'm a, I'm a decent Dexter Fletcher fan. And so I'm like, he I, I assume he was brought in to just carry the torch at the end. You know, he is the director of Rocket Man, And uh, I guess he's directing the third child Holmes. I know him from Eddie the Eagle, which I think is a super sweet movie. You know, he's done a bunch of other stuff, but. But yeah, so I, oh, man, and he did not write this. I will give him credit for that. He did not write this. It was written by three people. Oh, never a great sign. Uh, Chris McKenna, Rhett Reese, and Paul Wernick, who also are like relatively, I don't know, something, something bad, something went wrong. Something went wrong here. Um, you know, again, I think this was a bunch of people looking at, you know, the formula and the algorithm. And they're like, yes, if we put these two popular hot people together in this mediocre script people will love it but oh man no there's no accounting for human chemistry so i'm only gonna give ghosted a 1.9 out of 5 and i again i almost wish it fell into like a campier category because then i would have been like yeah i mean in talking about it i can't wait to talk about how bad it is with some folks so please come back for a roundtable episode but 1.9 out of 5 for ghosted <laughs> And then the next film I have is called Chevalier. It is based on the true story of a composer called Joseph Bologna. I think I'm saying that wrong. He's played by Kelvin Harrison Jr. But, you know, he was the Chevalier de saint George, which, again, I'm saying with a terrible accent. But basically, he was the, well, I guess, a little illegitimate son, because there's a gross, you know, a, a cruder way to say that, but of an a African slave and a French slave owner. And I guess he was a very impeccable composer and violinist and so he was sort of uh, uh elevated in french society by marie antoinette and so it's about his sort of straddling this world of not belonging but being incredibly talented and having to deal with you know being a outsider a person of color in a not accepting society but having the endorsement of the upper echelon the uppermost echelon of society uh, yeah so this is one of those things where i'm like Okay, I think it's good that a story like this is being told because admittedly, I, I had no idea about this character. You know, um, they explained why at the end. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. But the way that it is told, it, you know, I feel like it's like a 
a history lesson instead of a, a character going through a journey, you know, and, and a lot of it is his exploration of the blackness of his character and, and coming to terms with that instead of trying to fit into society. But I, I feel like the story's happening to him versus him being the main character in his own story, which, you know, is somewhat true to life in that there are a lot of circumstances that guide us. But I just wish he had felt more rounded and we'd maybe spent a little less time dealing with the other characters. You know, it's got a pretty decent supporting cast. You've got Samara Weaving, Lucy Boynton, Ronke Adekolejo. I'm so sorry if I butchered that. Martin Kosak's Mini Driver, Sian Clifford. And, uh, you know, uh, the music is good if you like classical music. I, I think they... Uh, anytime there's a, a movie about a musician slash composer, it's always a little bit hard because you like, you know, they're going to be super talented. You know, it's it's kind of one of those. Yes, they have to practice hard, but there's sort of a, a nature given gift involved. I, get, I thought it was decent. It's also hard to watch just because, you, you know, you, there's a reason we haven't heard of this character before. And, and while it's great to spotlight these stories, there's there's a, a sort of level of knowledge going into it that it's not going to be the happiest of any. So overall, it's under two hours. You know, I think it's worth a watch. I'm not necessarily saying run out and go see it in theaters. I, You know, this might be one that you could wait until it's on streaming or available on demand. But I'm going to give it a three out of five. The next film I have is a documentary. It's called Judy Bloom Forever. And I will make a very honest admission here. I don't think I've ever read a Judy Bloom book. You know, I, I know her most famous one is Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, which is being turned into a movie that comes out soon. Shocking. And so the timing of this is, is convenient. But yeah, so I was not familiar with her work uh, growing up or as an adult. And so I did appreciate that this film made me feel like for better or for worse, I'd missed out on something. And I probably had uh, a lot of misconceptions about what her books were about and I, I think the film does a decent job of sort of it goes a little bit chronologically through the course of her life and you know I, I give her credit for being such a prolific writer and obviously having such an impact on so many people I am excluded from that but I, I went with a friend who is a huge Judy Bloom fan and it was nice to see sort of how the moments where she was so excited to see some of her favorite books mentioned and and so I, I respect, you know, the the sort of impact this woman has had over decades and decades. And while in the film acknowledges this, you know, some of her materials are uh, they've not aged as well in some senses. She still is, you know, a, a relevant author and her there's a level of her stories that are timeless. And I really appreciated that. And it made me want to read her books, sort of. Um, I mean, it made me want to read her books, but also they're like, I have a stack of books that I need to read. But I think if you were a Judy Bloom fan and you've like not picked up one of her books in a very long time, this is going to be such a great watch for you. You're going to be so happy about it. I think if you are like me and, you know, not super familiar with her, but you want a crash course, this could be a good way to start. They bring in a ton of folks, uh, you know, famous uh, in, in literary circles and other media groups and, and, and other sort of echelons of pop culture to talk about her impact. And it is interesting to see the, uh, the sort of commonality there, even though they don't all have things in common. And then they also, I guess people have been writing to Judy Bloom for ever since she started publishing. And so it's kind of cool to see the interactions with the fans who have been fans for a very long amount of time. You know, I respect her. I respect Judy Bloom. That's what I will say out of this. And I feel like I learned a fair amount about her. There is this sort of lens of because she is so heavily involved in it, I'm sure some of it was sanitized, but she does feel like she's being pretty candid about some of the stuff. So I, you know, I give credit where credit is due. I'm going to give it a 3.8 out of 5. And the next thing I have is a series. It's called Mrs. Davis, and it's out streaming on Peacock. I have seen the first four episodes episodes of it and it's going to be an eight episode series it's interesting that they uh, dropped you know they did this with something like poker face they dropped four episodes at once but so it stars betty gilpin who i think is such a good actress she is just so good and she is fighting against an ai <laughs> basically you know it's sort of a, a ubiquitous Siri slash hey google-esque thing that has taken over which is one of my great fears honestly yeah it's it's interesting I think a lot of it relies on the strength of her performance she oh sorry she also plays a nun that is probably one of the more important things and she's just 
so reticent to interface with this thing, but then the universe or higher powers potentially force her to cross paths with it, and it goes from there. It's created by Tara Hernandez and Damon Lindelof, and so there are a few moments of it that give me a little bit of Lost vibes, but I was a big fan of Lost, and I do think there's some of the sort of like woo-woo mystery weirdness of it that does remind me a little bit of Lost. It it feels tighter and more, well, obviously more modern because it's coming out now, but it feels tighter than Lost did. I, I feel like they have a direction they're going. Some of it gets a little existential and strange, but I don't necessarily dislike that. Um, I say this is someone who has zero relationship with Christianity, and so I don't bring any baggage to that. I mean, I bring the baggage of like, organized religion has its issues, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, so I'm not I'm not looking at it from that lens. So in that sense, I'm able to enjoy it and how they represent sort of her faith and, and things like that. And the, the hilarity of this nun who is doing some of these actions, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm on board with this. It's also got Jake McDorman, Annie McQueen, character actress Margot Martindale, one of my favorites. But yeah, it's a it's interesting so far. I definitely want to see where it goes. I had watched the first episode and folks were saying, oh, you know, do you recommend it? And at that time, I was like, I don't know yet. And one of the caveats I will also say is it is a little bit more violent than I was expecting a a Peacock show to be. And not that I don't don't know why I have that sort of thought on Peacock. Maybe it's just because it's so heavily affiliated with a broadcast network like NBC, even though they bring in stuff from all over. But anyway, uh, just a caveat that it's a little more violent action-y. There are a lot of threads going as it goes along. So be prepared for that. If you liked Lost, I actually think this is worth checking out. If you hated Lost, not enough time may have passed since that type of mystery has gone. But I do think they have a a stronger direction for this one. But I've enjoyed the first half of it so far. So Mrs. Davis is streaming on Peacock. And then the last thing I want to point out is Indian matchmaking has returned. And I'm a big fan of this show. You know, it is fascinating Obviously, it's highly produced, and so you're not getting necessarily, like, a a true look at this dating culture, but I think it's really hard, you know, modern relationships are really challenging, and I've actually noticed there's a couple movies and a couple things coming out, you know, that are fictional, this is a docu-series in quotes, but that are fictional that also center around the idea of, you know, an arranged or an assisted marriage, and so it is resurfacing, and so, you know, I've been watching this show since the beginning, and it's interesting to see some of the folks, like, come as repeat customers. There there are moments where, you know, I'm like, oh, should I get a fill in the blank? You know, a a face reader or something like that. But they only show maybe the better news out of those folks. So anyway, I, I just think it's, you know, if you are a member of that community, it might be a little too close to home in some senses. But as someone who's in a geographically tangential community, like I appreciate some of the crossover there. But I also acknowledge that like some of this feels like a little tiny bit of cultural voyeurism. But, you know, overall, I think, because there are so many folks represented from so many different backgrounds. If you like dating shows and matchmaking shows and like a married at first sight or a love is blind or whatever, like there's, this is just a, it's a fun watch. So Indian matchmaking season three is out now on Netflix. 